You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am one of your hosts today, Jimmy Wong. And I'm the other host. It's Rachel Weeks. Today, we are talking about something that is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, something I actually just learned about in my life in the past several months. And it's something that I've been able to institute to help me become a genius. That's yeah. right. A bona fide genius. Jimmy Wong. Genius. genius. <laughs> we'll talk a little about that later. But today, we're going to talk about how to find your quote unquote zone of genius, not just in life, but when it comes to Magic the Gathering and Commander to get the most fun out of your game because you might be feeling stuck or unfulfilled or in a rut. Well, we're going to fix that today. Well, we're going to try and fix that today. <laughs> but before we get into it, we got to talk about our sponsors because once you find your zone of genius in Commander, you're going to want to play more Commander. And that involves going to cardkingdom.com slash command, which is one of our amazing sponsors of the show. At Card Kingdom, you can enter into their zone of genius, which is having a well-stocked supply of Magic the Gathering cards across every version, everything that you could ask for, as well as singles, sealed product, and more to deliver right to your door in one amazing package. We love Card Kingdom. By using this affiliate link, you're also supporting the show and getting the cards you need. So after today's episode, you might find yourself inspired in a brand new way to brew up a new deck or to go to another game night. If you do, make sure you have everything you need by going to cardkingdom.com slash command. Speaking of everything you need, go to ultrapro.com slash command to get all of the magic accessories that you need to keep your cards safe and organized and looking cool. Cool. Ultrapro has some of the highest quality accessories in the business, including play mats and deck boxes, sleeves, binders, everything that you use to sort your cards and keep them safe while doing so. They also just restocked the keyword dice. <gasps> the keyword really? counter dice. Yes. Can we pause the podcast? I, I know. Get them. Go get them. <laughs> they They're sold out so, so quick. So nice. Um, that for like flying counters and that kind of thing. Yep. They're really nice for when you're playing commander and you can just know what's on your board because you have the tools to do that. And you can do so while supporting the show at ultrapro.com slash command. The last place to support us is directly patreon.com slash command zone. There you can find out about other people's zone of geniuses. You can ask us about ours on our Discord. Every single patron gets access to that. You can also hear about the amazing after the game commentary from people that are on extra turns with Turn Talk, which is at a higher tier of exclusive content. There's tons of stuff patrons get. Oftentimes, Rachel will pull the patrons and get yeah. their answers to put into podcast episodes. We had uh, submissions for deck lists for extra turns at one point. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on there. You don't want to miss out and we shout out one lucky patron every single week so this episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to brian Grim. Grim. grime grimes Graham. Graham. you rock right. brian you do rock thank you so much all right our main topic today how to become a genius at commander we're gonna talk about something called the zone of genius but mm -hmm. before we dive into that we should talk about a well-known concept that is associated with the zone of genius called flow state yeah. Raise your hands in chat if you've heard of flow state before. I know that one. Yeah. So oftentimes this is used in the world of athletes and high performance, you know, business people, artists, mm -hmm. creatives. But it's not uh, just that. In fact, it's actually everyone in this planet, I would argue, has been in flow state at least at one point in their lives mm -hmm. or another. You may just not have realized that you were in a quote unquote flow state. Yeah, I feel like this is a thing that normal people f experience all the time. Like, I think about when I was a teenager, I used to, like, um, like decoupage all the time. I would, what like, is decoupage? Like, like collage. Oh, cool. Uh, all the time. And I would sit and cut out magazines on my floor and, like, glue stuff and tape stuff for hours. Nice. A little bit manic, but... I would lose like eight hours doing it. And you'd and blink and sit, then boom, you're out of yeah, it. Yeah, and I would sit in silence. A lot of the time I had no music on. So wow. I'm just like quiet on my room doing this like sort of soft task. That's cool. And that feels like a flow state, but it's not something that you would have experienced. And it's not something that you think about as like high stakes. Yeah. You, well, you wouldn't have like 14 year old Rachel being like, hi, mom, I just had eight hours of flow state. I'm really operating at my best. Yeah. Look at this collage. <laughs> Look at this collage. It's <laughs> sick. It's got Justin Timberlake on it. But you lose time and you get very focused and, yeah. and uh, you really zero into the task. That's exactly it. So flow state is this feeling where under the right conditions, you are fully immersed in what you're doing. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people now listening are like, wait a minute, I have done that before. Mm -hmm. So time feels like it doesn't exist. You can't be disturbed. You are in, quote unquote, the zone, the command zone. 
mostly the zone. <laughs> um, so typically, this was like popularized by a guy named, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher this, Mahaili Csikszentmihalyi well done. and Jan Nakamura. Thanks, Sheen, for having an easier name. Um, <laughs> In general, it's it's described that people are the most creative, productive, mm-hmm. and happy when they're in the state of flow. So would you describe yourself in the collage moments as creative, productive, and happy? Absolutely. And I you feel like sort of unwatched too, which is kind of nice. Even like if you unjudged. are watched, interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because that you the world beyond what you're doing and what you like who you are is yeah. sort of fades away, gets blurry. Yeah. And you're just like making. Yeah, in a lot of ways, you are directly connected to exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Typically, when we do stuff, it's filled with the anxious, egoic mind of, Mm -hmm. who's looking at me? Do I look cool doing this? Oh, gosh, I hope she's watching me. My crush, I hope he's watching, right? Like, all this stuff fills in the space between you and the action you're doing, and you're no longer really present with it. But in flow state, you're really present. Absolutely. And it's just like, it's less about, like, is it good? Yeah, it's just, it is. Look at it. It there is. It is. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a perfect way to describe it mm-hmm. because good is something that, again, our conscious creates. Mm-hmm. The universe does not look at your collage and go, mm, that's kind of bad. I don't know if I these like These purples it. clash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's strange that the lighting doesn't match on these two yeah. images. I don't think that world cares about good or bad, right or wrong. No. Those terms don't even exist to the creative mind. Um, so examples of flow state in non-Magic the Gathering scenarios. So in sports, the football... The big football game just happened. Anytime a player is functioning at their highest level and making clutch plays, Mm -hmm. like catches that seem like miracles, just delivering on a play that didn't think could happen, but oh my gosh, somehow they caught it, somehow they did that, somehow they pushed through, that is often seen as a flow state. Mm -hmm. Or Usain Bolt setting the world record for the 100-meter dash. Yeah, um, he's not thinking about that every second. He's practiced enough that it like it yeah. becomes a flow state. So yeah, yeah. He's not taking each step and going, "Oh man, left, I hope I look right. cool." Left, <laughs> left, right. <laughs> left. Don't forget that. Don't right. Forget left, right. Don't forget. I did two rights. <laughs> <Shoot>. <laughs> I tripped. Uh, in music, I think jazz is the optimal time to see flow state because you'll if you watch like jazz performances, it's almost like they go into a trance during a solo. Mm-hmm. They're they're in a different world. And they are just able to just flow into the music and not, and sometimes create beautiful things that they may never even remember afterwards, but Mm -hmm. they were in the trance or in a state when they did that. Uh, And then if you've seen The Queen's Gambit, have you seen that? I have. I think that's a really uh, interesting and modern way of displaying what flow state looks like to that main character. Yeah. It's it's such a difficult thing to depict because it's such an internal feeling. But the, the fact that you can kind of see how everything else sort of disappears and it's not really about what's behind, it's about the board. Mm -hmm. Um, The game and the thing that she's doing in front of her. Right, exactly. So what are some examples of flow state in Magic the Gathering scenarios? Mm. Has anyone ever watched a Pro Tour stream? Oh, yeah. I would argue that that is a great place to see flow state in action, in Magic. Absolutely. It's... The funny thing about watching pro players play these days is they always play with a camera because that's how the, most of the time it's yeah. it's inner it's global, right? Esports. So <laughs> there's like you'll see some of the most focused people who are not worried about the camera at all. Yeah. Shot from like here up and like <laughs> most of their bedroom. <laughs> Or when they started, they were like, all right, can you frame up? They sat up, they did it. And then when they're playing, they're, they just slowly they're into their new out of yeah. screen. <laughs> and like, you just see like <laughs> an eye and a forehead. It's it's one of the most bizarre things about, about pro players is they always sit at the bottom of their screen. But it's mostly because they're not worried about that, right? Yeah, like they they're, <laughs> they're so zeroed in on lines and the game and their deck and their opponent's deck. Yeah. And like they're two turns ahead and what if, oh, a different two turns ahead. You have to be unfocused from all of the other, yeah. you know, distractions. Yeah, you've got like, so some of the greatest players of all time, like John Finkel, Paula Vida, Damodorosa, Reed Duke. If you just go watch any of the streams when they are on a Pro Tour win run, mm-hmm. they're they're going 13-2, and two, you know, just absurd, mm-hmm. playing against the best players in the world. John Finkel does this thing where he, like, rubs his head a mm-hmm. lot, 
and that to me is a great example of like he does not care how ridiculous he looks. Yeah. He doesn't care if anyone out there thinks about how he looks. He mm. is focused on winning and focused on the game itself. And that to me is a, a great way to see Flow State in action in a yeah. game. Yeah. When you watch Reed stream, even even then like he's he's streaming and he's playing, but it, I don't think you quite get it like Reed quite gets it to this level when he's streaming, but sometimes when a turn gets tricky, yeah. he just sort of stops talking. Yeah, yeah. He'll withdraw from the need to interact with chat, right. reading chat. He's just about what's in front of him. Just to think, 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 think. And yeah. Reed in particular is very slow and like purposeful player, so it's interesting to watch him sort of disappear into a moment of a game. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because you said the word think, and mm. sometimes thinking is in when you're in the zone and you're doing your collage, yeah. you're thinking about what you're doing. Doing, but there's also a mixture of like non-thinking, which is just pure feeling. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I would argue that pro players as well as athletes, if they think overthink, then they're in a position where they can't actually get out of their situation. Right. If they underthink, then they're not thinking it through. But there's like a level of right amount of thinking and then right amount of, mm -hmm. what do I just feel is the right thing to do here? And yeah. that's from a culmination of years of experience, knowing the matchup, mm -hmm. knowing the opponent sometimes, how they play, are they bluffing or not? Um, so it's like this interesting balance and there's no exact math about it. You can't say like, oh, Reed Duke is a 50% thinker, 50% feeler player. Because that might also alter and change. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll just get a feeling like, you know what? I do need to draw that extra card here to see what's on top. As opposed to, I should tap out and play this thing instead. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll watch players play and, and they'll just be like, mm, it feels like this. Like, play limited. You're like, it, yeah. it feels like this trick. Yeah. Or it feels like, uh, it feels like they have this sorcery removal spell. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why? What gave you that? Yeah, 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 yeah. What information did, did you somehow glean that I am completely missing? And they're <laughs> like, it just feels like it. Yeah. The way that they're tapping their mana or something like that. Or in the early um, game, they're like, I think I need to just attack here because I need to play to my out. Right, and yeah. that is another area where I think people get into the flow state of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm ignoring that wild six six flyer on the board because I know they're going to swing, and the only way I can win is if I if I find myself into this position and these cards. Right. Even uh, pro players will will actually use a word fade when they're talking about stuff. Um, they're mm. like, okay, if they have this trick, I die anyway, so I need to fade that because it doesn't matter if they oh, have that. Great, there's yeah. nothing that I can do about it. So why even think? So about why it? even think about it? So mm. I'm fading these options that mean I don't win and I'm trying to find the ones that are scenarios where I do win and that's playing to your out but even fade really really describes the the headspace that they're in yeah where it's like we're just looking 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 we're ignoring fading this fading to the side letting yeah. it fade into darkness mm -hmm. And then I can focus on the light, which is winning this game. Yeah, very Beautiful cool. imagery. Beautiful imagery. All right. So now we know a little bit about flow state. Let's talk about the zones of function. So the zone of genius concept was introduced by an author named Gay Hendricks in the book The Big Leap. And in it, they describe four primary zones of function. So... Again, uh, before we begin, I want to say, don't get attached to your feelings about the words mm -hmm. of what I'm about to say, because you might be like, oh, I don't like that word. Just lose that for now, and, and, and you'll see where we'll get to. So the first up, the first primary zone of function is the zone of incompetence. Yeah. So you might understand now why I'm like, don't take it as an insult. Everyone has zones of incompetence. So this is a zone that all of us can be in. Uh, where you're engaging in something that you inherently do not understand or you're not skilled at. You are incompetent at it. You are not competent. So activities that other people would probably do better than you. Yeah. So in my example, a zone of incompetence is fixing my car. Yep. I cannot fix my car. I should not try to fix my car. <laughs> it will most likely damage my car. I will need to watch many videos to even get above the layer of competence, incompetence to get to fixing my car. So that for me is a zone of incompetence. Mm. What about you, Rachel? A big one for me that I've struggled with my entire life is I have a really bad spatial reasoning. So mm. I, I, don't, I don't know how to navigate in my car. <laughs> like I, I'm very, very bad at you it. You need GPS. Where I'm like, I need GPS constantly. Right. And it's like, I, it, it's something that we talk about all the time. He's like, you do, you can't just feel where home is. <laughs> I was like, no, I cannot feel <laughs> the cannot presence feel of home. home. <laughs> you can't just feel that we're le like, I, I, I was going to say left of our house. That's how bad I am. Amazing. <laughs> like I don't, it's, oh, well that's west of us. So we're down here. Yeah. You're like, no, that means nothing to nothing me. Nothing to me. I have no map <laughs> in my head that like draws it out. Right. 
I don't I can't picture anything in relationship to each other. Amazing. So I know that like it's something that I've just never even worked on fixing because mm-hmm. it feels like I'm missing inherent pieces to be even be better at it. Yeah, that's great. And there's again no shame, no guilt, yeah. nothing about it. It's just what it is. I just have tools that I need like I use to get through it. Yeah, and there's a world where I can get better at fixing my car, and there's a world where you can add yeah. some navigational skills to you, but we have chosen not to because it's a zone of incompetence. You have GPS, yeah. I have a auto repair shop. Yeah. So the next zone is the zone of competence. So not incompetence, Great. but just regular competence. So this is you're doing something you're efficient at, you're good at it, you're okay at it to good at it, mm-hmm. but you also recognize that many people are also good and efficient at it. You're not really distinguishing your capabilities and doing this in any way where it's like, if you did this for someone, they wouldn't go like, whoa, incredible. That's amazing. (laughs) It's just more like, thank you. Yeah, you did it. So for me, (laughs) a zone of competence would just be regular old cooking. I can dice an onion. I can cook you a general soup and things. I can follow a recipe pretty well. General soup. It's my favorite General soup. soup, yeah. It's just an right average after, soup. <laughs> it's a general soup. It's right after General So's chicken. <laughs> I don't even think I know how to do that. Now, you might find it funny because I had a cooking show for 10 years, but mm. on the show, I was literally meant to be the guy that's not that great at cooking. Right. They taught you how to cook. Yeah, I was just figuring it out each time. So mm. I would say that's a very competent zone I'm at. If I cook someone something, they're not going to go, wow, this is like a Michelin star meal. They'll go, yeah, it's tasty. Thanks. So I'm competent at it. Yeah. How about you? Mine, uh, apparently they're all driving related. Um, <laughs> no, it's great. But it, I picked parallel parking for this one. Oh, uh, amazing. It's something I've practiced a lot because uh-huh. like that it, throughout my life I've needed to be competent at it. And it's not like every single time I got it, I nailed it. But most right. of the time, yeah, I can fit in like basically any parking spot. I can get it done in, in a couple of tries. And yeah. I'm definitely not hitting anybody's car. <laughs> But while you do it, no one's being like, wow, Rachel's incredible at yeah. parallel parking. What a gift. <laughs> <laughs> she <has>. Amazing. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So, by the way, I invite everyone that's listening along, as you're listening to us talk about this, see if you can identify what zones you are in mm. uh, and how they may apply to you. Maybe you're the same as us so far. I would say fixing my car is a pretty common zone of incompetence. Yeah. That's, I'm in that one, too. All right. There's a lot of us in there. There's a lot of us. The it. auto zone, There's a- if you will. <laughs> Turns out an entire industry was built out of that zone of incompetence. <laughs> yeah. Who does not give? All right. The next zone is the zone of excellence. So this is something that you're doing something that you are tremendously skilled at or very skilled at. You've practiced it for a lot. You've cultivated the skill over your life. Uh, it's been established over a period of time. Typically, this involves something that you've done a lot, put a lot of hours into. You mm. don't. People don't reach the zone of excellence without some work having been put into it. So these are activities you're great at, better than most normally, uh, but don't necessarily love to do. And this is important, right? You can be very good at something, but it's not this kind of thing that makes you wake up and want to do it every single day. It's just over time, you've just gotten excellent at it. So you enjoy it, you can enjoy it, but not necessarily love it. It's mm-hmm. not your, like your top most priority. Like if you went to a deserted island and you could only take one thing with you, it might not be this thing. Mm. But it's something that you're very good at. Yeah, and you've practiced and you've honed and you're mm-hmm. generally better at most people at. Um, a lot of times this will relate to the job that you do. So if you're like a mechanical engineer or mm-hmm. you operate heavy machinery, right? You're very capable, you're excellent at it, but not necessarily something that you love to do. For me, it's an interesting one. It is acting. Mm-hmm. So I've been an actor for 10 plus years. Uh, I enjoy it a lot. Even throughout my 10 years and doing the biggest roles I've ever done, you would never catch me saying, I love acting. It is the most thing I'm most passionate about in my life. I right. wake up and I live by acting. Acting was sort of like a skill that I knew I could do and enjoyed doing. And there were jobs along the way, so I ended up doing it. But it's not something that I would, you know, die on the hill for. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. It's a great skill. It served me very well in a lot of different scenarios. But if I had to go to a deserted island and only bring one thing with me, it would not necessarily be acting specifically. Mm-hmm. What about you, Rachel? Mine's similar. I mean, it, it's also career-based. So that's uh, that's a big part of this. But um, my primary job before this one was graphic design. Mm. So, and I got into it because I like liked using the programs in high school and I liked the just sitting down and kind of working on something like quietly with headphones on Mm -hmm. is like, I liked that. And it sort of leaned into honestly, like the collaging flow state thing. Oh, interesting. So that's that. 
sort of thing did get me into some sort of, I don't know if it's flow state necessarily, but it's sort of like quiet and yeah. um, not necessarily super thinky, which was Yeah, nice. yeah, you can sink into it. But I'm not like an artist. <laughs> like I wouldn't consider myself a digital artist. <laughs> I did like a lot of... I did a lot of um, text layout and like pamphlets and gotcha. um, invitations and like like just collaging, paper. like collaging, yeah, like yeah, yeah. very much like a similar thing. Um, and nothing that I made, I feel like, was super above average, like as far as designers go. Mm-hmm. But it was always pretty good, and I was pretty good at it. I would say so. You designed a lot of our thumbnails for. Yeah, I've been Commando. working on it. Yeah. So if the editors want to show just a display of some of Rachel's some top of the ones hits, I made, there are some really good ones in here. Yeah. And designing for a thumbnail is, is its own art because you're designing for something that's tiny on a page, mm-hmm. as well as something that looks big, and as well as looks good on a phone. So yeah. There's a lot of different elements that go into that zone of excellence for you. And it's something that interests me. Like I want to be good good at making thumbnails and I want like I've been learning a lot about it because mm-hmm. it's not exactly the kind of design that I've done a ton of yeah but I it's not like I wake up in the morning and was like you know what I got three more ideas for a thumbnail today <laughs> and I feel energized amazing you wake <laughs> up from a dream you're like I just dreamt of six new thumbnails I have a new layout idea what if we put the title at the bottom <laughs> <laughs> what if it's not exactly uh, and there are there are graphic designers that are like this is like yeah. making typefaces is my passion yeah and I is love like, fonts yeah. So, yeah yeah and I'm like yeah you know I got a four or five that I like using yeah, yeah <laughs> we'll yeah, go yeah, back yeah. to those probably <laughs> <laughs> the old wheelbarrow um, what's important to know is that you can enter into a flow state in both zones of competence and excellence yeah I would actually say parallel parking is a great one to enter into a flow state in because after a Ooh. while you just know how far you are from the car in front of you, mm-hmm. how far you are from the curb, and you can figure it out. Sometimes you, have a you mess car it long up. enough, you really understand how big yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, you can get into a flow state in zones of competence and excellence. Probably not zone of incompetence. I mm. cannot get into a flow state in something I'm not I good at. I cannot imagine. <laughs> but it's important to note that flow state doesn't necessarily mean you're only doing it when you're in your zone of genius. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about now the title of this episode and the the main subject of this. So the zone of genius. Mm-hmm. So in this specific zone, you are capitalizing on your natural abilities, which are innate rather than learned. So oftentimes it's not a developed skill over time, but it may have informed why you developed that skill. And this is the state where you can very easily get into the flow state. You can find endless inspiration. The energy just comes to you when you do it. You don't seem to know what time is when it's happening. You're not drained at the end of the activity. And you come up with things that are, you create that are uh, things that are distinguished and very unique and do so in a way that excels not just a little bit, but sometimes far and beyond what other people are doing in this space. Mm -hmm. Or it's something that's so specific that other people just, no, no, that's, I I don't really have much to do with that. So you could be in a zone of genius fixing cars, for example. Yeah. But that might be closer to, you're just a a genius at fixing things. Right. You can understand systems really well. It's not just the car. You also help fix the water system in your house or whatever it is. So you could just be a genius fixer. You could also be a genius cook. You could be a zone of genius actor or a zone of genius graphic designer. Mm -hmm. So all these things that we've said it just depends on who you are and what is in your life that is you know something that you're just uniquely good at you love to do so much so time and space disappear likely when you do them Mm -hmm. so my zone of genius is more is kind of related to acting to sort of speak to my earlier point but it's closer to hosting and i'm not talking about hosting specifically like hey everyone welcome to the command zone podcast that is kind of what i'm doing here but more hosting as well as in like, hey, welcome to the office. So nice to have you on a tour. Mm-hmm. Or like, hey, I, I haven't seen you in a while. Come to our house for a potluck. Whatever that thing is, right? So like creating community environments where people feel protected. It's a container where they can enjoy themselves, express themselves, and have a grand time. So that kind of hosting, which is creating community, might be a better way of putting it. And that's mm-hmm. led me to acting. That's led me to why I did cooking. That's led me to this podcast. So I'd say a zone of genius, something I get endless energy from, is bringing bringing people together either as a host or hosting an event and creating a space for them to then express themselves to their maximum potential. Mm-hmm. I was This one was tough because I was trying to think about it outside of a magic space, which has really been sort of where my energy has been focused mm-hmm. lately. And I do think that if we think about it in terms of like a broader sense of like where I feel most, most genius, most energized. Yeah. Is like, is 
puzzling things, like figuring stuff out. Mm. I like solving, like I like problem solving. I've always liked, um, uh, you know, it, like team building activities. That, like in high school, we had yeah. we used to do a ton of those in our gym class. And that was like... I'm like I'm taking the lead. We have a plan. We're doing this, and we're and we're solving this problem. And other people are like, "Please take yeah, the lead. go, go, yeah, do yeah, whatever." Awesome. You're for some reason you are into this. Yeah. Um, so I and I so I do think like just generally logic puzzles and trying to untangle a big knot is cool. Is really where I want to be, and I do think that that's sort of related to social stuff where I've always found I found myself the mediator a lot Hmm. where like there is a like a social tangle there's two people that are fighting there are two groups that are fighting yeah and I've tried to solve that interpersonal problem yeah even if that isn't straight up just like a Sudoku puzzle (laughs) it's a similar thing where I'm trying to like I'm interpreting what you're saying to mean what this is saying and then we can find what the actual problem is right you're like seeking the truth underneath it right so I would say that that's like if we're if we're thinking most generally, yeah, that's where where I feel most fulfilled. I think it's interesting. How has that shown up in your life in the pursuits that you have? Because you also wrote something down here that I think is very kind of related to it. It is. it is solving it's, a very complex puzzle, one that I would never dare to do. It's tangentially related. So I wrote down stand up. Um, in stand up, I'm in a complicated spot with stand up right now, where I'm like I haven't done stand up in a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that I liked most about stand-up was looking at the world and writing it in a different way that gives a new perspective on it, right? right? So I liked I liked sort of switching things around and being like, oh, I never thought about it that way, and now mm. I understand it better, um, was like how I liked to write jokes. So I do it's think- Kind of like problem solving. It is kind of like problem solving. It is looking at stuff in the world and sort of pointing out the absurd problems with it. Right. And You're then, mediating the world to the audience. E- which is strange. And I never really what thought about stand-up that way. Yeah. But that is what I liked about it most was mm. the writing part of it. Like performing was fun and you can definitely like zero in on, like you'd certainly go into a flow state in a yeah. good set. Um, but the thing that I really liked most about it was people being like, I remember that and I think about that all the time. Incredible. Yeah, like that was my favorite part about it. I love that. Mm. And it brought you energy, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, very cool. I guess collaging is kind of the similar thing. Kind of. You take a bunch of things and you put them all together. It's and like you're recontextualizing something it's in a the way that... It's a jigsaw puzzle with random pieces. Yeah, so image-based Sudoku. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so those are the four zones of function. Before we dive further, I would again like to remind everyone that you know, there's a, the word genius has a loaded term. Mm. Oftentimes you'll have someone that was called a genius at a young age. And then that has been something that has tormented or haunted them in a lot of ways, because now they have extra expectations. And so I would like anyone that's listening to throw away any preconceived notions you have about words in general, (laughs) genius, excellence, incompetence, competence. These are all just ways for us to better understand ourselves, right? This is an episode about self-awareness, most of all. Mm -hmm. And everyone's completely unique in their own way. There's no world where I'm trying to say that my zone of genius is better than yours or more superior, useful, right, wrong, right? Mm -hmm. These are all just words that, again, our egoic mind likes to attach meaning to. And so the better that we can ignore that sort of first instinct of reactiveness, the more that we can come to a fuller understanding of how not the world is doing something to us, but rather what we do for ourselves. And so that's like a big thing that I think is important is that what you deem for genius for yourself is something that you can take pride in. It's not something that you need to compare to someone else necessarily. And that's the importance of this exercise is all about ourselves. So what's it have to do with commander? Well, Let's talk about the command zone. Let's talk about the command zone. Yeah, because we're trying to discover our zone of genius for magic specifically. And you'll find by the end of this episode that you can also apply that lens to your life and vice versa. And you'll find that there'll be a lot of similarities there. Mm -hmm. Uh, So magic is a immensely complex game. There's probably near infinite possibilities when it comes to just card interactions. And more so every year now that we're printing so many cards. And you multiply that by all the other factors that exist. There are different formats. There are different rules for each format. There are different combos that can happen. There's different competitive formats. There's different ways to build decks. There's a whole infinite possibilities in terms of how politics can work in the game. 
you can get very easily overwhelmed as a player or as someone that's especially new. So we started this podcast, Josh and I, originally to help people get better at Commander and the game. And even 500 episodes in, there are still so many topics that we haven't covered. Um, Rich, I actually would love for you to speak on this for a little mm. bit because you, one of your jobs as sort of like the new podcast host is how do we distill down the stuff that we want to talk about versus also the obligation of talking about the new cards that come out and the new mm. commanders. So what has that process been like for you as a player in terms of like, how do I make this podcast something that's not just uh, another set review, losing interest back to the zone of competence and mm. instead figuring out how to bring genius into it? I think... The most rewarding thing about doing this podcast and even doing set reviews is um, making people feel confident in a very complicated space, mm. right? So any episode that we do how-tos, any episode where we explain interactions, any episode where uh, we talk about giving players more tools to have a more fun, more rewarding commander experience, mm-hmm. that just means that you're having more people feel like safe and knowledgeable and comfortable in their hobby, which is great. And I mean, especially when it comes to even something like set reviews, which feel very monotonous Yeah, to be like, we're going to talk about the same commander. We're going to like, explain through sometimes very similar sets of cards mm-hmm. over and over and over again. How many times can you talk about aristocrats? Is like, <laughs> we're talking about this for, you know, the 10th time, but there's a lot of p- players that are listening that have only heard this twice or ever mm. not heard this at all. And, there are players that are uniquely excited about this commander. Um, And if we can give them the tools to be more confident and feel more, um, you know, sort of safe and less overwhelmed, then that makes commander more accessible. It makes commander more fun. um, And generally I think just benefits magic overall. So lovely. I, I think a big thing that I've, I've had to shift my perspective on, especially doing set reviews is like, we're talking about commanders that get everybody excited and especially new players. Yeah. Like I get into commanders that are, that are weird and complicated and have like, I have to figure out how to make them work. <laughs> right. Puzzle solving. Puzzles, puzzles. Um, but there's commanders that excite the general population and I need to make sure that I talk about those two, mm. not because they're rewarding to me to talk about, they're rewarding to people to hear about. And the rewarding part for you is figuring out how to express them in that right. interesting and unique way. Yeah. And like just to make people feel validated in in being interested and engaged with this one specific character or card. Yeah. And so when you're a player, there's a lot of different commander types, player types that have different reasons why they're having issues with the game. Mm-hmm. So for a new player... They just don't know where to start. Yeah. They're incredibly overwhelmed. You tried to have a pre-con game with them the other night, and the stack got so complicated that they just tuned out entirely. Mm. How are they going to get into the game? There's novice players that may be not improving as quick as they'd like to, or they're focused in the wrong areas. They don't know what to focus on even at all. Mm. And then you have like veteran players, people that are hitting a wall, or just might be burnt out, frustrated, bored of the game, looking for something new. And so applying the concepts of the different zones to any level of magic player is a great way to help you sort of clear these hurdles that are in your way, whatever they are, and bring into yourself a deeper awareness of, you know, why have you chosen this hobby? Mm-hmm. What are you choosing to do with this hobby? And how are you making it the most enjoyable and fulfilling for yourself? And again, you can apply these same lessons to your regular life and find similar results. Mm-hmm. So that is going to be the next thing that we do on this podcast episode. We're going to go through an exercise together. That's right. But you don't need to get out of your chair, which is great. So my favorite kind of exercise. <laughs> Change into your sweats, put on your tennis <laughs> shoes. Here we go. Lie down. Uh, so you can determine what your zone of genius is when it comes to magic and commander. And then we can use this newfound knowledge immediately to improve our gaming experience. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our Midroll sponsors. Hi, I'm Zealous Conscripts. And this is the love of my life, my Valentine. <laughs> On our own, we're both good cards, but together our potential is unlimited. It's combo time! That's That's the power power of a good pairing. And you know what I've been pairing lately? My Raycon wireless earbuds with my favorite audiobook, Infinite Jess. (laughs) So much Jess! We both use our Raycons every day. The audio quality is incredible, and they're just half the price of other premium brands. The eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life are perfect for indeterminately long walks with our cat, Felidog Guardian. Good kitty, good kitty! And Kiki loves the optimized gel tips and perfect in-ear fit. 
set, because they never fall out no matter how fast he combos off. Of course, our favorite feature is the noise isolation mode, so we can enjoy a quiet night by the fire. Just him, me, and 12,000 additional copies of me. Watchy, watchy. Go to buyraycon.com slash command today to get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's buyraycon.com slash command to score 15% off and free shipping. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. Hey, psst, over here, it's me, Tunnel Tipster. You want to save some dough this year, right? I got a hot tip for you. If you switch to Mim Mobile, you can get a wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month. Big wireless? Those guys are suspect. They don't want you to know about this. But with Mint Mobile, you can have a three, six, or 12 month plan. Then you ain't gotta worry about monthly phone bills at all. That way, you can gap to your heart's content with a limited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network of informants. I did a little digging, and I found out you can even keep your old phone, all your numbers, contacts, the whole shebang. Which is great unless you're trying to be in disguise, in which case, get a new number, I guess. So switch to Mint Mobile and get your first three months of Primo Wireless for just 15 bucks a month. But if anyone asks, you didn't hear it from me. I'm just a cute little mole. <laughs> I don't know nothing. Tell him it was Ryan Reynolds or something. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. I think it might need more card draw. Who are you talking to? Or is that just something you say? Oh, no, I'm on a call with Jimmy. We're uh, building a Chatterfang deck. Ooh, I just added Toski. That should help, right? Whoa, the card just showed up. Yeah, with Architect, you can collaborate in real time from anywhere in the world. Changes show up immediately. You don't even have to reload the page. So it's perfect for brewing with a friend. This is cool, but isn't Jimmy just upstairs? Yeah, but I'm I'm downstairs right now. I ain't coming downstairs. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. All right, everyone, we are back talking about your zone of genius in commander, and now we're going to get right to it. We're going to figure out what is your command zone of genius. <laughs> so if you would like to participate together in this episode, this fun interactive episode, consider putting aside other activities you're doing right now if you have the time during this section of the podcast or wait uh, until you can really focus on what we're saying so that you can do it together as well. Mm. Uh, if you're someone that works really well taking notes or journaling, you can get a notepad out or open up a new document on your computer to write stuff down. We're going to specifically focus on discovering your zone of genius as it relates to magic and commander. But throughout this process, you might discover other aspects of yourself. We both have kind of done it as just talking about it in this episode. So don't be afraid to take note of that stuff as well, um, because it's often going to relate directly to your magic experience. Because this is one of my favorite quotes in the universe, Rachel. Mm -hmm. How you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. And once you know how you do it, then you're like, I ah, see what's happening. And yeah, oh, I can change how I do something and it affects how I do something else. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a quote that I heard like in the last two months, I think. And it's really helped me a lot in terms of growing in self-awareness um, because when it comes to understanding your innate skills and abilities, it's a great way to give yourself a new lens to look at things. So when you grow in awareness of who you are, you also get to notice more and more small and specific details that you might have sort of missed prior. A great example is we were just talking about zones of genius and Rachel was like, wait, I really like puzzle solving. Mm -hmm. And you were able to tie that in by just growing a little bit in self-awareness and realizing, wait a minute, how I do anything, how I structure, how I do the podcast, how I do my thumbnails, whatever, is kind of how I do everything. Yeah. Um, so once you can start linking those dots together, more realizations emerge. So how you do anything is how you do everything. All right, let's get into the exercise now. Let's do it. Exercise number one, general questions. So in the book that I talked about earlier, The Big Leap, Hendrix poses a few questions that we can ask ourselves, and we've reframed them to apply them to the context of Magic the Gathering. So when playing or engaging in the hobby of Magic the Gathering, question number one, what activities do you do that are easy and enjoyable? And what's something that you really look forward to in Magic? So my answer for this is I love drafting. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that Josh and I first got into Magic in, as a whole in the, our newer sort of like revitalization of our hobby. And I also really love hanging out with friends and catching up and the antics that you get up to in the middle of a game. Because you come up with those crazy stories where everyone goes, holy, no way. And you hear it from across the office. You know something <laughs> epic has happened. You're like, that's Commander. Yeah. So that's something that I really enjoy and they're easy as well when it comes to magic. What about you? Yeah, I 
I, you know, again, sort of wrote stuff down and and have a different, slightly different thought about it. But <laughs> uh, the first thing I wrote down was playing Cube, which is what I really, really like doing right now. It feels oh, so like fun. there's no pressure on Cube and it's a really cool sort of ephemeral way to play Magic where it's like you have a deck and it's special for a moment and then it's gone. Ooh, and you can do it again. Uh, and you can do it again. Um, you know, you can assemble a different piece. Yeah. Um, but the... The other thing that I really look forward to, especially, um, you know, when it was when it was less of my job, but still is going through new cards and mm-hmm. seeing which ones work with decks I have. Oh, that like so really, like, like ooh. new pieces are very exciting. And it's something that I would do all the time. Like, would you just check Mythic spoiler and see what comes right. out and be like, oh, I need going to need two copies of this and it's got to go in here. And, you know, you dread maybe the physical swapping of, like, taking, like, (laughs) buying the card and putting it in and finding a cut. But seeing a new card and trying and being inspired by the possibilities of it has always been something very exciting to me. Very cool. Yeah, so if you're playing along at home, write down, think about in your head, what is it about magic that you really enjoy to do that's easy and enjoyable? The second question in this first exercise is, when playing or engaging in the hobby of magic, what produces the highest ratio of abundance and satisfaction to the amount of time spent? So again, what produces the highest ratio of abundance and satisfaction to the amount of time spent? So if you could only do something for 10 seconds, what is the thing that you're doing that creates the highest amount of like, woohoo? For me, this is the group dynamic thing I spoke of earlier. When you're able to pull off that clever politic thing, or you're able to do that combo that no one saw coming, whatever that is, uh, or just like hosting a game that created an amazing, memorable experience, that to me is like, oh, so satisfying, super fun. I think it really does relate down to the players going, no way! Even if it's not something I'm doing, if mm-hmm. I'm able to contribute to that environment, that brings me the most happiness. Mm-hmm. I, I like accomplishing the no way right it that my favorite thing about magic is when you plan a deck to do it you thing, are the no way i'm the facilitator like, i know i <laughs> want to do the no way when you when you put all these cards together and you're like hypothetically it does this yeah and then you play it and it does that and you're like it works <laughs> and everyone's like no way yeah, you're like what a weird pile of cards that you've assembled incredible uh, yeah i i really like that I get a lot of joy from people looking at my deck lists and being like, what is this doing? Mm, Very Uh, cool. And talking about that. All right. So again, if you're at home, answer that question for yourself. And finally, what is your unique ability when it comes to playing or engaging in the hobby of magic? And this is, again, along those same lines, which is I like to make a game memorable through the actions that I take. Mm. If you watch game nights, you'll see this happen a lot. Jimmy did something very silly and very chaotic. Jimmy is pulling off something that is very risky and weird, but as a result, it's very memorable. Mm. I think Professor is actually very similar in a lot of ways, is that he'll do something or create a deal or make a silly voice that is so weird and bizarre, (laughs) but you can't help but be like, man, remember that episode where that happened? I will remember that forever. Mm. So that to me is something I really enjoy doing, and it's also a unique ability of mine because it just very comes naturally to me to be like, what if I just mess with things a little bit here in an <laughs> unexpected way? Whereas like the Josh Lee Quiet players are typically not in that mindset as they're more focused on, you know, optimal game actions and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's such a great skill for Commander and it, it makes Commander so much more fun to actually play, I think, to... To be like, you know what? I don't care about what happens. If this <laughs> works, it's going to be incredible. Yeah. And, you know, my brain when I'm playing goes, if this doesn't work, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> my brain kind of goes, if this doesn't work, yeah, at least I tried. Eh, we'll have another game. Yeah, maybe uh, and part of me goes like, maybe this will inspire someone else to do something wild in the future that creates another scenario. Right. Or inspire someone to go like, wait a minute, I didn't realize you could do that in mm-hmm. Commander. Yeah, that's a, that. a huge thing. Um, I don't my my unique ability, I guess, in Magic is um, I know a lot of cards and I know how they work and I'm I'm excited about them and so when people play them or when I play them, I get really excited about weird old stuff, especially when something on your board interacts strange yeah. with something on my board. Um, I've like I've seen a lot of it and I've tried a lot of it and I get very excited when something new happens because again the you know magic world is infinitely big mm-hmm. and getting bigger all the time um but I feel like as far as like if we're talking about just have read and know what 
a large percentage of magic cards do. I know most relevant modern magic cards. I think you're the most deeply knowledgeable at the entire office. It's, I would argue. I don't rules interactions are difficult sure, for me, sure. and it's something I'm still learning. But, but we're what just talking about do, like yeah. what are, like I know the commander, I know the power and toughness. I like basically know those, and it's it's more even than like a lot of pro players because I know all the casual cards. Yeah, like of course I know all the competitive cards, but I know like the weird phase out your board yeah, and you've proliferate never, You've never card. seen it played before, but I love it when I play with you because someone yeah. will do something and you go, oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, I have no idea what, what the is cards happening. Just played. What yeah. is happening? How does Rachel instantly know <laughs> and has now six layers deep knowledge of what could happen, what she's going to do? I'm like, ah, cool. Yeah, I, I think that's probably where I excel most in magic yeah. is just basic memorization skills. We should talk about the new Capenna thing. Oh my God. Every, almost, I would say like 90% of the time someone plays a card and everyone goes, what is is that Rachel? You'll say this, and it's true almost every time. <laughs> New competitive commander, baby. There's some weird, cool cards in there. <laughs> there is a card you don't know at the table. It is most likely from New Capenna's commander set. New commander, <laughs> New Capenna commander. I very underrated commander product, full of really cool cards. Yeah. Okay. So now that you have answered these questions at home, take a moment to reflect on them. Right? Uh, is there any extra clarification you might be able to give the answers now that you've put them out into the open, maybe for the first time ever? And are there other things that maybe came up in the process of you doing it? Right? Like it's kind of like uncorking what, like a plugged well. Sometimes, mm. if you don't do this often to think about it and bring that self awareness, it could be an explosion of new things coming out of that. And you're like, wait, there's something back at the back of this pipe that was pl- clogged up that I didn't realize is actually something I really love to do about magic, and it's now coming out for us. So this is a great time for you mm. to reflect on that at home. Um, and there's also a great time to reflect on things you don't like because those will come up in the process as well. So I think part of this awareness exercise is great. You recognize that there are some aspects of your hobby that are more important or enjoyable than others. And there may, maybe there are some that you thought were important, but actually aren't that way to you. It could be that when you started playing, everyone was in the limited. So you were just kind of into it as well, but it's mm-hmm. actually not what you love, but you've been trained to be in the zone of excellence about it, but not a zone of genius. Mm-hmm. All right. Moving on to exercise two, activity tracking. So in order to understand where the zone of genius might lie, the self-awareness needs to grow. So this is something you can do not just for a single instance, but you can do across a lot of different ones. And, And the more you do this, the more clear the answers will become. So basically think back to a recent time that you played Commander or Magic and sort of what led up to that as well. So if you have a game night coming up, Uh, You can also apply the same tracking here because prior to the game night, there's a lot of prep that happens, which is building the decks, putting the stuff together, collecting the cards and all that. So think back to everything that happened leading up to the game, as well as the session of play itself, everything that happened around that. And the more data you compile, the better, because again, the data will help point you in the right directions. Um, So I'm going to just sort of read through some quick notes that I took around a draft commander night that happened recently. Mm -hmm. So I went through this exercise and I wrote, drafting commander night at the office. We're doing murders at Karlov Manor. I spent two hours prior to that night putting together a new deck. I was excited to test it out. I spent a couple of hours flipping through binders and picking out exciting cards that fit the deck's theme. And at the end of it, I had this big pile of cards and I felt this sense of dread knowing that I need to eventually put them back. The game night started. I spent about 20 or so minutes greeting people, talking to them, catching up. Uh, We gave like some quick tours to some people around the new office. Uh, And then the first thing I did was I joined a draft. And I remember being excited to both draft and also tell other players that were newer to draft, like, okay, we're opening a pack, passing it to the left. Um, people that had a bunch of questions like, how does suspect work? I'd be able to answer that question at the table. Um, so I did a lot of that. I was excited to draft too. I haven't done it in person in a long time. I played two games. I had this like clunky five-color deck. I had to mulligan a lot. Was not very happy about that. And I remembered eyeing the commander tables as they were playing and going like, is the game over yet? Can I drop in on the game yet? Because the best part of drafting, I realized, was just the drafting. For me, the, playing the games are fun, but I really love the drafting part, so I was ready to move on. Uh, after that, I played a single commander game. I got to test out the new deck, which was my goal all along. It was a really politic light game because no one was playing blue, so everyone was just foot on the gas pedal. Go, go, go. Yeah, play 80, Magic 80 was card. playing Stang. Yep, that's and it all was go. Great. It was like playing with you almost, but <laughs> 80. Um, and I had a lot of fun. I remember working through the sequencing for the first time with the deck. And there was a turn I remember specifically where I was like, okay, I can literally murder a player with the new Frodo, Sauron's Bane, because it has the, yeah. if this hits a player, they die. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that because I like what the player's doing with their deck. It was a Rocco deck. 
and I wanted more shenanigans to happen because this was going to be my only game of the night. So I decided not to and just do other stuff to impact the table and just, you know, test out more sequencing and more stuff. And then I finished the night and I went home very tired. So that is the example of doing just one night or one play session of Commander. If I could do this for multiple, then great. And Mm -hmm. again, the recall here is going to help you build out the next part of this, which is exercise number three, the energy audit. So it's a very practical exercise that you can do to figure out what falls within your zone of genius. Um, Before before we move on, I do want to talk about activity tracking a little bit because this is a super, this is a super detailed, um, like description of one night. And I think it, a lot of the time when you think about commander games or commander nights, you're like, I played this deck against this person and this happened Mm -hmm. and like this was fun. And you think about it in terms of cards. A lot of what you wrote about is is like is emotional stuff, right? So it's like two hours before I had a lot of prep and I had to get all of this ready. And then there's a lot of other obligations that come with having a game night like hosting or, um, you know, drafting beforehand. And being able to recognize all of the different ways that you contribute to the magic hobby and all of the different, not contribute exactly is like participate in yeah, the magic yeah, yeah, hobby yeah. is really important because it's part of like organizing cards doesn't feel like a fun hobby, but it's it's part of the hobby or like yeah. updating your decks or resleeving something or even just watching a streamer. All of that is participating in magic. So being able to recognize when when you're doing magic stuff Mm -hmm. (laughs) because sometimes it's a lot like we're magic players we can get pretty obsessive it can occupy a huge amount of your life right so being able to recognize how much of your life it's occupying and what parts of it (laughs) are good and fun for you yeah uh is a huge deal here and it's not just you know we're commander players so it's often physical playing but it's how you interact with arena Mm-hmm. Actually, I would argue that a lot of time in command, I would wonder what the actual percentage is. Of just is playing? Of just playing versus all the other stuff that gets around it. Right. Driving to the store, buying stuff, looking online, reading, listening to podcasts. Mm. Kind of reminds me of like when you see someone playing golf, the amount of time they actually spend swinging the club is like a tiny percentage. Right. Of the it's total mostly time. walking. It's mostly walking, planning it out, looking, understanding, prepping, and then mm. the actual swinging, Right. Right. So that's a great point, though. Thank you for uh, recognizing that. So when you're doing this exercise and you're writing stuff down, take note of everything that is involving you and magic Mm -hmm. because it will be very important for the next exercise. Yeah. And the next exercise is number three, the energy audit. So this is very practical. Uh, It might seem basic, but it's actually very effective because it helps you understand a very basic thing, which is what gives you energy and what drains you of energy. And if you're having trouble understanding what you do in a game night or maybe you need help with the the activity tracker, you can also talk to friends that know you really well and ask them like, hey, was there anything else I'm missing from this night that happened? Mm-hmm. And they were, might remind you of something because oftentimes we have a lot of blind spots when it comes to our own hobbies because, again, we're laser focused. We might be in the flow state. So we miss things. So now that you've written down either one game night and prep session or maybe a few you can begin the energy audit. So go through the bullet points that you just wrote down and you can use a highlighter to do this. You can just write a check mark or an X mark next to it. But you're going to ask for each activity. Did this give me energy or did this drain me of energy? Mm. And you can do green if it gave you energy, red if it drained you. And again, be as specific as possible, both with the note taking and also what you're auditing energy wise. And that way you can really narrow it down to what is it that's draining energy and what that's giving energy. And that's going to help you determine that zone of genius. So... Think back to that prior example. What gave Jimmy energy? I really enjoy flipping through binders and choosing cards. It's really exciting. I would imagine that also yeah, gives you energy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I really enjoyed greeting and catching up with new friends and giving them mini tours and having and sort of feeling their excitement as they came to a game night because we haven't had one of these in a while. I loved drafting the new cards, helping the table out, talking to people during that process. I really enjoyed sequencing with my new deck. And finally, I really, really enjoyed, and it gave me a lot of energy, the table politics to making things a little chaotic because I was already tired at that point, but Mm -hmm. playing the game and able to do that was something that I was like, oh, here's a renewed burst of energy that I didn't have prior to that. Mm. Also, I had a huge piece of pizza beforehand, so I was feeling a little heavy. Also, pizza. Pizza. Both gives and drains. And drains, yeah. (laughs) Amazing what that does. All right, so the things that drained my energy that night would be, again, the first one is looking at that huge pile of cards to organize and knowing I'd have to do it. I was like, oh, gosh. 
Uh, and then this is an interesting one is was building a deck in a rush and then missing things because I realized afterwards like oh I forgot to put this land in I just skipped over that card entirely I was thinking about putting this card in earlier but I just didn't do it in the process um, I, playing the draft games also drained me a bit of energy because I got really frustrated with the mulligans not mm -hmm. having a deck that I was able to build and craft and then uh, also waiting for other players to finish pods while I was just sort of sitting there anxiously I was like oh this is not I was getting I was feeling more tense mm -hmm. as a result and then, of course, playing late into the night and driving home afterwards was something that took a lot of energy for me, too. So, now that you have identified activities that drain energy specifically... I, I want to mention, because I do think you could do this list with your decks. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? How so? I think you could write a list of all of your decks. Yeah. And when you're excited to play it, Ooh. You, hit it you hit it with a green. And when you're like, uh, I guess I'll bring this one because I haven't played it in a while. Yeah. Or you like feel begrudgingly you, you bring it out. Or when you're playing it, you're like, oh, gosh, this is a really complicated turn. I'm making people saxed. I don't like this. Yeah, exactly. Like mm. keeping track of how a deck feels when before you play it and while you're playing it and then maybe even after you've played it. And even specific cards. Is going to give you a, hu a ton of information about I mean, this is, you know, this is me being a brewer. Uh, I love that, actually. But, like, the, you, can, you can be like, ugh, every time I've played this, I kind of had to drag it out and feel yeah. like I had to test it, even if I'm not necessarily excited about it. Yeah, yeah. Every time I play this edict effect, I don't feel good. Yeah, it doesn't. It makes me actually kind of sad. Right. Is there another way I can replace this to make it feel good instead? Right. What are that's, cards in my deck that make me feel good? And that's the next question, is what you do with all of this drains energy part of your hobby. Because yeah. hypothetically... You want your hobby to gain you energy as much as possible, right? This is yeah, totally. You're spending your time. This is free time. It should be. You're good. spending money, free time, effort, and it, often taking away time from other things. Mm -hmm. If it's an activity that you come home from and you're drained, not maybe not in the right place quite yet. Yeah, like should I be playing constructed on arena if I don't feel good after yeah. a couple of games? You know. Yeah, yeah. Like, should I be grinding at these tournaments where the only time I feel good is if I win? Right. I don't enjoy the deck building process. I'll enjoy the whatever, right? I don't even enjoy the deck. The deck is just right. I just had to net deck whatever the right, thing yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. Great call, Rachel. Hey. So now that we have a list of things that drain our energy specifically, giving energy is great. Take note of that. Know what that is. Feel into that. But with the things that drain energy, you have a couple of options on how to deal with it. So you can either eliminate something that drains energy, you can outsource something that drains energy, or you can make it awesome, which is one I like a lot. Mm -hmm. So magic is a very personal hobby. Outsourcing it might not make sense to you quite yet. But if you get into a creative mindset about it, you can actually figure out ways to do so. But let's start first with eliminating it. So in the case of the example of the deck, if you have mm -hmm. a card in your deck that is draining you of energy, what do you do? To I mean, eliminate it. It's pretty easy, right? You just don't play anymore. You just cut it. Like, if you have a Cathars Crusade on the table, <laughs> and you're stressed about managing the dice and doing the math and trying yeah. to win and taking up time, take it out. Take it out. Take play it out. Play an anthem effect. Like a if single anthem effect. If it's stressing you out more than it's, like, exciting, yeah. take it out. Especially, Even if it's a good card. Yeah, especially if you're like, I, I am only playing this card because the internet told me to. Right. Or someone said I had to. You don't have to. The great thing about Commander is you don't have to do anything. Yeah. The only like the only strictly wrong card in Commander is a card you don't like playing. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So in my case, I was looking at the big pile of cards to organize. I was yeah. like, how can I eliminate this from my entire flow? Which is like, oh, I can just be more decisive on how I choose cards and plan ahead. Right. Which leads to the outsourcing it part, which is I said building a deck in a rush and missing things was something that drained me of energy. How could I possibly outsource helping me build a deck in an office with one of the best brewers in the world? Ask me. I have people I can ask. I've built the deck that you played. Yeah, you have. <laughs> and it was great. Yeah. But not just that. I could be like, hey, Rachel, I'm thinking about building this. What comes to mind? Mm -hmm. And you can give me some suggestions. I can add that to a list. And instead of being like, oh, I got to build this deck in two hours, I can go, great. I'm going to give myself more time before mm. I get into the deck building process. I can still flip through binders and do all that stuff. But this way, I'm not doing it in a way that's just me pulling out everything I see, not understanding I've now pulled out 200 cards and having right. to put them back after. So I get to make a choice to say, like, I can be more 
uh, deliberate in how I start to build my decks and use the resources around me so it's not as chaotic when I get there. And I skip the feel bads entirely when I miss a card because now I've been like, cool, I put the, enough thought in that I can be really conscious of what I'm doing here. Mm. And I've now outsourced something that has created a drain of energy to me. And maybe I've even given Rachel an opportunity to gain energy as a result. Yeah, I love finding a weirdo for a new deck. Yeah. Um, There's also a Discord, by the way, yeah. which can do the exact same thing. Highly recommend it for our Patreon members. You can also build online first. Put yeah. together Put together the ideal list. This is how I've been doing it lately, is you, is you put together the dream list. Yeah. Like fi- finances, cards, whatever. Doesn't matter, yeah. Doesn't matter. Throw that all to the wind. Then you go through your collection, you find those cards, mm-hmm. cut everything you don't have. Ooh. Or set aside the ones that you're excited to buy. Yeah. And, or trade and, for or whatever. Or trade for or get, get access to. Um, and then replace all the other ones. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. I love that. Um, so if you're like, I don't have this $20 card, it's not going to excite me to like spend $20 on and it. And then put it in, yeah. And then you just pull that out and you pull something from your collection and put it in. And it, all, it saves you time so you haven't pulled out a ton of cards. Mm-hmm. Like I don't go through my whole collection and... Um, pull a bunch of cards that I think will be good. Yeah. Because you end up with 200 cards sitting on your desk mm-hmm. and they're in piles everywhere and every time you walk into your room, you want to scream. Yep. And It drains you of energy. It doesn't make you go, I can't wait to clean that pile up. That's yep. for me. And it doesn't drain you of energy once. It drains you of energy repeatedly. Yeah. Every time you see it. Yeah. You're like, I saw that I did that thing. Yeah. But like, if you plan ahead and you know what cards that you're looking for, because I like, like playing with specific cards. Mm-hmm. So if I can build mm-hmm. the dream deck first... And then pull all the cards for it. Then I've taken care of the part that isn't as fun. And it's much more manageable to be like, cool, I don't want to play this card anymore. I'm going to replace it with a new card to do a one-for-one replacement instead of doing it in the way that I described earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Another feel bad I know a lot of people have that might drain them of energy is thinking about the card they want, but they can't afford Mm -hmm. or they can't find a way to get it. Yeah. And I would say you could actually choose a different route, which is you could choose to try and trade. You could choose to send cards into a buy list. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to go about it that doesn't drain you of energy. And now all of a sudden you can feel like you're solving a puzzle or you're outsourcing it to someone else to help you ask around. Hey, I need some help finding this card. Does anyone have it? Does anyone want to trade for it? And being able to like a big, a cool thing uh, about it is you can, you can be like, okay, this card I definitely need for this deck. Like this is an expensive card, but it's really, really good in the deck and I definitely want it. Where can I cut corners elsewhere? Can I play Mm -hmm. slightly efficient, less efficient ramp? Can I play slightly less efficient removal? And can I like unload those cards in exchange for, you know, this one piece that's very special and exciting Mm. about this deck? Yeah. So prioritizing what cards are important and what cards are exciting to play and, you know, sort of trimming back on the cards that are like not as exciting to put in a deck anymore. Yeah, it's a great point. All right. The last way to fix or uh, sort of adjust things that drain energy is making it awesome. So I wrote down that waiting for other players to finish their EDH pod was something that drained me of energy because I was Mm. just anxious. I was waiting. I didn't know when it was happening. I didn't want to spy on the game to figure it out. I was just like stuck. And the way to make that awesome is just knowing, one, that waiting is inevitable at mm-hmm. game nights, and you can do something during that period of time. I was just sitting there waiting around silently. I've talked so much about how socializing with people, mm. catching up is something that I really enjoy to do. So instead of just waiting around and putting myself into a rut, I could have just talked to someone. Yeah. I could have gone online I, and figured out a card that I needed, right? There's so many other things I can do in that period of time that would have brought me energy instead of sitting there waiting and doing nothing at all. Mm-hmm. I could even just spectate the game. I love doing that. I love yeah. sometimes just being there and being like, oh, don't forget, guys, you have to, you have to do this trigger. Mm-hmm. Like, that brings me energy. But instead, I decide to sulk. And that's not great <laughs> for me, at least. I've even found, like, I didn't write, or, like, write to do tables for this, but for me... I found a lot of a lot of time recently. I play a ton of Commander, mm-hmm. a lot. Like I play six games a week. Wow, probably I play a huge amount of Commander, but because it's not special anymore, I I get really frustrated mm. lately, especially when it's like when when my deck isn't working or when like you when there's lands, a card in the player yeah. you misplay or you or you don't draw like yeah you don't draw your lands or you you draw your deck out of order something goes wrong i get very frustrated and i found that even playing commander has drained some energy lately mm. and i'm still energized by building commanders and thinking about them and like talking about commanders but when i sit down with certain commanders or on certain days where i'm just not feeling it yeah. to play 
I can really poison a deck or like just not be in the right mood to make make a game fun. Interesting. Um, and honestly, I think I should just watch more Commander. I've had game like I've at game nights when you have five or somebody shows up late and you want to swap somebody in. Yeah, I've been offering to sit out a lot hmm. because I'm like. I get just as much fun out of watching the game and seeing how things happen and trying to catch triggers, like you mentioned, without necessarily... Getting into the must-play, must-participate. Yeah, not so. getting into the, like, I you know I have to win or I have to play this optimally or I have to do... I want my deck to work just so or mm-hmm. I will get frustrated with it. Um, and playing less makes it a little bit less... Um, more exciting when you do play. More exciting when you do get to play. Yeah. Wow, that's that's great. So you both eliminated it. Yeah. Play. You've outsourced it. Have other people play. Yeah, you play. And you've made it awesome. Participate in the way that you brings you fun. There you go. There's there mine. you go. So all possibilities exist. Uh, I I challenge everyone listening to work through the things that drain your energy and always know that there's going to be a creative solution around it. Right? Yeah. There's never. I, I deign to say never. There's rarely a time when it is so impossible to figure something out that you can't figure it out with the help of others or even by just listening to a podcast episode like this one. Yeah, and recognizing that something that maybe drains your energy now isn't isn't a permanent thing that drains your energy. I don't, right. like, playing Commander doesn't drain my energy all the time. But it's gone it's to just, a point where there's some, certain yeah. There's, like, certain aspects or there's certain turns or there's certain things that happen that, mm-hmm. that cause uh, me to be frustrated with it. All right, exercise number four. We're finally here. It's time to identify our zone of genius. We've been able to identify what gives us energy, what drains it. Now with all of these factoids... We can blammo it up, and we can pinpoint our zone of genius. So using this data that is now available, using the insights gained from this episode, what you've written down, ask yourself, what is the most effortless thing that comes to you when you engage with magic? What is natural to you specifically that provides you with more energy when you do it, that you light up when you get to do this, that's unique to you and maybe just a few others? What's that special something that makes you just so happy that time disappears when you get to do that thing? And to give you finally some more overall broad subjects, here's some examples uh, of of ways that maybe could be you. So you could be the deck builder and brewer. You love finding those unique interactions. You love to craft decks that surprise players. And you love it when maybe someone asks you about a card or a choice you've made. Mm -hmm. Uh, You could be a collector. You just love to collect. You love going to trade shows. You have a beautiful organized collection. You love showing it off to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, You love to trade. You know, I that. I also think collectors really curate how they build their decks and are very specific about like printings and stuff. So yeah, sometimes yeah. you can be like, look at this, all of my lands match. They also match the ease. Oh yeah, and my yeah. sleeves and stuff. Yeah, I feel that like could be that's genius too, s- for sure. Or it could that. be I love I have all mismatch lands, <laughs> and I love that it makes you frustrated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you could be the politicker and the person that just loves to play. You love to play. You're always crafting cool strategic deals, or you're playing the politic game in that JLK way that's like, wow, I can't believe you were able to pull that off. Um, you could be the altarist or an artist. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many of these on, on Twitter. I almost said X. Ugh. You love to <laughs> make know. altars of cards, whether they're hand-painted or it's a Photoshopped or it's a proxy. And people come to you and you love it when people request or commission something from you. Uh, you could be a pro player. You just love the highly technical competitive layers of the game. You're creating awesome win from behind scenarios. You're a coach. You can see lines that others can't. You're on a team. You're, you're playing at the Pro Tour. Maybe you won a Pro Tour. So those yeah. are some broader categories in case you've just still not been able to narrow it down yet. So with that, yeah. we're going to talk about our own zones of genius and how we got to realizing it. We've been talking around in the entire episode. You can probably kind of guess what it is, but let's just say it outright. My zone of genius is that I love to bring out the best in any situation and help realize more potential than people may see at that point. So my zone is very specifically tied to the social aspect of Commander, and it combines both my deep knowledge about the game, the fact that I love group gaming, I've done it for quite a long time, and social dynamics. And it highlights this, what I love to do, which is like, I love to make things more fun and feel more seamless for people. So I'm always, you know, in the past, I'm the one that hosted game nights, parties at my place. I literally built a company around this game, right? It's all there. And since I was very young, I've always been creating online communities as well. So bringing people together, cultivating a community, catalyzing people into really understanding how to have the most fun when it plays, uh, when it comes to playing a game. 
And so I like creating that exciting and welcoming environment that propels other people in that environment to realize more possibilities that can exist for them. Um, so I'm the right person to talk to you if you're in a rut and don't know what to do next to help bring you to that next layer of happiness or fulfillment with the game. Or I'm the person that adds that layer of chaos in that creates the potential for those crazy plays that people talk about. And sometimes through the process, I help other people come into a greater awareness about their own zone of genius, which is literally why this idea of the podcast was born, is I literally created this so that I could help other people realize what their zones are, similar to how I might host a party where you could come to and then come out of it being like, wow, I learned something new about myself as a player tonight. So I realized this zone by, uh, again, I just was able to look at what gave me the most energy and I deduced what were the shared aspects of that. I like drafting around the table, but the vibe that can be created when you draft. I love the socializing, great old friends. I like the politics and the chaos aspects of the game. So in each of those individual experiences, I was exhibiting what my zone of genius was in some way and heightening the vibe of what was happening around me and bringing others into sort of what I think is a larger potential for fun. And once I was able to see the different parts of my actions across multiple nights, it came more and more clear what was my zone of genius, what was in the zone of competence, excellence, and competence. Ta-da. You did it. I did it. All right, I Rachel. Mean, it, it's so interesting to think about genius in terms of social aspects, because that's not something that we tend to, like, as a society to give credit to, right? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. it's like, you're like, he's a genius piano player. And right. That, like, these are the a mathematician. Genius, yeah, like, yeah. recognize very specific accomplishments but being able to look at yourself and and recognize like where you're best and where you're um where you should put your energy because that's what you're best at giving to the world is awesome and it gains it's so you exciting energy as you do it and you're better and happier in your own hobby yeah a lot of people that are introverts are like jimmy is talking in a very strange language right now <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk for you guys, baby. Uh, my zone of genius is I just love magic cards. Beautiful. Um, I like the cards themselves. I like uh, top-down design that are creative and funny, and I like being able to combine two jokes across a decade that sort of work together in this neat <laughs> way. Um, and, I, and it's very... I, Commander is very much like collaging. It's really weird. To th <laughs> it's really weird. I like genuinely didn't think about it when, when we were writing stuff down for this episode. Yeah. But I was like, was like, it, collaging is going through magazines and cutting out things that you like and mm. combining them with other things that sort of work with those things. And that's what Commander deck building is. <laughs> is going on Scryfall and being like, what are all of the things that care about when artifacts enter the battlefield right. and how can we make those work together? Collage, baby. And, um, you know, it, not all of them are mechanical. Like, I like building themed decks. I build mm -hmm. battle box that's all in world. Um, like, being able to design an experience and really sort of... Um, create create something cool and creative out of the deck is is where I feel most energized and I think where my tools are best used hmm. uh, I think that's why I why I'm um struggle so much with constructed because I don't get to build it right somebody else tells you what you the get deck maybe is. a couple of choices yeah and there. then like if you build it it's probably going to be worse like it's yeah. just not better yeah. than what they're designing with teams and like they're more knowledgeable pro players hundreds of kind hours of, of testing you don't get to be creative in, right. in certain things like and if you show up with a creative deck you're going to lose a lot and that's so you have it's hard to balance both of those things yeah but in commander you can be as creative as you want and hopefully you can use that creativity to like you know achieve the outcome that you're interested in and I think that, like, just recognizing that where my energy comes from is the cards and the decks and being able to, I need to figure out how to celebrate those successes in terms of, like, the deck worked. Mm -hmm. Even if it didn't win the game, the deck worked. Right. And here's how it worked, and here's why it was exciting. Um, because when you get caught up in, you know, ones and zeros... <laughs> It can be really frustrating, especially like yeah. when you're a commander, you lose a lot. That's commander. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. lose seventy five percent of the time. Minimum. Hypothetically. Me like ninety percent of the time. Like ninety percent of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe ninety five, shoot. But if that's not where your energy comes from, yeah. then you can be okay with that. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm here and I'm like I'm 
trying to make sure I'm maximizing the social experience or I'm yeah. trying to make max maximize that I'm playing the cards that I'm excited about and I'm seeing them work together. And people are tickled um, by it. They're and like, people are, Ooh, yeah, what? like well, I've never seen. What is that? Go yeah. see it. Uh, those things you can take joy in and really focus on that. Yeah. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I realized it. Um, Cause I I just always like weird cards. People yeah. are like, how do you love that old card? We call you, them weirdos, I, and yeah. I love that. I started playing in, like, I started playing Commander in 2017 in Ixalan. Like, yeah. for, for, for like, a, like, Ixalan Rivals of Ixalan. The original Ixalan, And people yeah. are like, how do you know all these cards from, like, Scourge? <laughs> It's like I spent a lot of time on Scryfall. A yeah, lot, a lot of time. Cards just being like, show them. me all the dragons. Right. I just want to see them all. I just want to see them. I want to see gonna all read the them. weird little boys and girls. Yeah. <laughs> I bought so many cards because I'm like, look at that. That's really weird. Yeah, yeah. Why did they make that? Yeah. AD literally has a binder called the Weirdo Binder. Yeah. <laughs> that we buy cards with top-down design that are like, this is unplayable garbage, but we have an old border foil, and that's what's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's beautiful, and yeah. it's signed by the artist. And every time you look at it, you're like, they made a little guy that gets bigger if I pay one and gets smaller <laughs> if he pays one, and that's not why. <laughs> why would you do that? Uh, so, but there will someday be the perfect, the perfect place, place for him, that, and yeah. I want to make sure that there's a place in Magic for those kind of cards. That's beautiful. Yeah, so. you said a really important word in there, which is mm. design, and we yeah. talked about you being a graphic designer earlier. Mm. I think in a lot of ways you are a game designer, mm. but within the world of Magic, which has been your specialization, you've been able to really pull out the maximum amount of like creativity as a game designer within the structure of what magic's that's why right. we love magic right it's such a huge game yeah that all of us can literally inhabit the full-blown role of a thing within just the game itself yeah and you've done that beautifully so i also love that you come up with cute nicknames for cards yeah it's like in <laughs> like, terms of endearment <laughs> and like really great jokes around the table yeah. when we're playing where it's like and AD does this a lot too he which does, is why you guys yeah, work so well yeah. together it's just like look at this like fun little dumb thing look, look at this little bozo yeah they what is this guy doing bing bongs has bing been the bongs. one we're using lately <laughs> <laughs> oh this is a real bing bong deck <laughs> incredible 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 so you just live in magical christmas land i think i mean yeah that that's where i really want to be i want to be where all the cards are working perfectly i don't want no Nobody's man is screwed. You yeah, know, like yeah, that's yeah, yeah. like that's where I want to play magic. And, uh, you when know, you deck build, you get to do that. Exactly. Yeah. Everything goes perfectly in deck building. All right. The final exercise for the zone of genius. Now that hopefully you've been able to identify yours is to hone your zone. So this is <laughs> upkeep, untap, upkeep, draw. So you might just be coming, uh, be, uh, coming into a new awareness about yourself for the very first time. Awesome. Amazing. Welcome. Uh, maybe you've been doing this kind of exercise for a long time. You know exactly what your zone of genius is and how you relate to magic as a hobby. Uh, so I'm going to read a quote from the author of the big leap where the idea of the zone of genius was first introduced. As with any other kind of lasting, meaningful change, commitment is the gateway to the zone of genius. When I work with busy executives, I start by asking them to make a commitment to blocking out just 10 minutes a day in their calendars to devote to cultivating their genius. The 10 minutes can involve journaling, meditating, or any number of other activities, just as long as you are focusing on your genius for 10 uninterrupted minutes. After you've gotten your 10 minutes a day with your routine, bump it up to 15 minutes. Ultimately, I want to see people I work with spending 90% of their time in their zone of genius, but you've got to start somewhere. And my recommendation is to start with 10 minutes a day. So in Rachel's case, you obviously don't want to spend 90% of your day just building decks, mm -hmm. but you can spend 90% of your day in a zone of creative problem solving, mm -hmm. designing, all that sort of stuff, right? What we said earlier, how you do anything is how you do everything. Your collaging into deck building is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm challenging everyone out there. I think you can find a way to live your life where you're always gaining energy in, act, in choosing to do activities in a way or altering the things that you do so that you're never in a spot where you're forcibly f draining yourself of energy to do something. There's always a way, a creative way around the things in your life. There's new possibilities that exist. And obviously small bits of practice can add up to a big difference over time. So the next time you're at the game night, next time you're prepping or whatever it is, just see if you can focus on devoting your energy, very being very present to just what your zone of genius is and see if you can also see it happen as it happens because it's a really beautiful thing. So finally, don't worry. If you haven't identified your zone of genius yet, it's okay. 
It might take some time and some help even from friends to help identify what your zone of genius is. Feel free to ask for help or just, mm -hmm. you know, hey, Rachel, what is, it, what is it about me like? It's a very <laughs> intimidating question, but I find that, one, we love compliments as humans, yep. and people are happy to give compliments if being invited in to do so. Um, there's also likely going to be clues in your non-magic life that's going to point you in the right direction when it comes to why you are engaged in this hobby in the first place. Mm -hmm. So figure out what that flow state is for you when it comes to the game. And yeah. that, my friends... I mean, is the zone of genius. Just taking, just like writing something down will make you look at it again. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if you're like, I don't know what it is. I don't know like what, what my specialty is. Just write it down until you recognize a pattern. Yeah. Um, All the clues are there for sure. And it's like, just, just don't do it in an, a non-judgmental way. Um, I feel like a yeah. lot of people really wrap, wrap a huge chunk of their identity around this game. Um, and there's been a lot of frustration in Magic lately, I think, especially when, when like more cards come out and things yeah. get more expensive. Or the company does something that doesn't agree with why you're here. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it can be a really frustrating thing to be a part of, um, especially when you're like, I'm the cards guy. Like, I'm the cards gal. Mm -hmm. And they're making more cards than I can get my head around. So making sure you're not wrapping up self-worth in it and making sure that it's like... It, it is from a non-judgmental and yeah. energizing space. Be kind to yourself. Yeah. You're the only person in the world that you can guarantee to be nice to you. So mm -hmm. why not make that choice? All right, to the listeners, what is your zone of genius? You could have predicted this one from a mile away. <laughs> uh, when it comes to commander, when it comes to life, how did you come to realize it? Were you in a zone of excellence before you got there? Were you in the zone of competence? What are your other zones, in fact, to let us know what this process has helped you discover? I hope to see a lot of comments from people after they listen to the episode. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we get comments in the first 20, 30 minutes or whatever. But feel free to come back and comment again, especially after you've done the exercise. I think it'd be really fascinating. And you're going to write something that will at least, I guarantee you, someone out there can read it and relate to it. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they may be able to find their zones as a result of you sharing. So thank you everyone so much for participating in this fun exercise. Before we go, let's talk about our sponsors one more time. Rachel, why don't you talk about Card Kingdom? Because I love cards. Good thing Card, <laughs> That's right. Card Kingdom has them at cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards. If you're doing deep dives like I am into old weirdos that are, uh, you know, damaged. Or <laughs> I like an old damaged foil. I love them. Incredible. Because uh, it's lived a life, yeah. you know. Card Kingdom it makes it very clear what kind of cards you're buying, which I like a lot. Mm -hmm. When you can go, you're like, I know I want a foil, but what foil? And I know even among those what condition yep you can set like you can look sort by cheapest to most expensive if you're just interested in getting a card mechanically plus they have a huge selection of cards so if you're building a new deck or if you're upgrading a deck you can buy all those cards in one place and get it shipped to your door in one safe professionally packaged package we Love trust that. card kingdom with our cards here and you can support the show without spending any extra money by going to cardkingdom.com slash command buying the cards you're gonna get anyway yeah and of course if you want to accessorize and make your collection look real cool ultrabell.com slash command for the collectors in us for the zone of genius person that's just like i build the coolest thematic game night you've ever seen mm -hmm. and i throw a darn good party too ultrapro.com slash command is the place to go you can theme out your entire area to be the warhammer set. Yeah, get that giant play mat that covers the whole table for oh, the next game so cool. night. I love yeah. those. We We're... don't have a table that's big enough. <laughs> <laughs> get it to cover your tiny desk and yeah. have a drape over the sides. But ultrapro.com slash command gives you those options so that you can really express yourself in the way that fits you the best. Maybe you're just the person that has a black play mat. There's nothing on it. Maybe that's all you want. Cool. Ultrapro.com slash command has got that as well as deck boxes, sleeves, play mats, uh, wall scrolls, dice, the special mechanical counter dice. Ooh, oh, they're so nice. So cool. So useful. I will definitely be doing that right after this show is over. So ultrapro.com slash command. And you can, of course, also just buy Ultra Pro product from your local game store and support them that way and us at the same time. All right. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. We got Damon Lenz, Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garab Galati, Jordan Pridgen, Jamie Block, Arthur Meadowcroft, Manson Long, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Wallow, Evan Lindberger, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, and Joshua Lee Kawhi, everybody. Thanks for watching, everybody. And we'll see you next time, geniuses. Bye-bye. The Command Zone. The Command, the command Zone. zone. Da, 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 da.
for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> Get in the zone, the command zone. Oh, no zone. <laughs>